Welcome once again to Grow This Personal Podcast, your number one podcast for personal growth and development. Today we have a fantastic and phenomenal guest. I have met um, Wura for a few couple of months, and she has been, you know, phenomenal in her delivery when we have a course to be in a particular event. And I've watched and observed her, and it's someone that's so so inspiring with what she has, she has been able to achieve. And I believe that she, the conversation we're gonna to have today is gonna to make an, a huge impact on who, whosoever is gonna listen or watch this episode. Um, Wura Da Silva is a corporate commercial lawyer in the Regina office of Mila Thompson, LLP. Her practice focuses on merger and acquisitions, corporate reorganizations, corporate governance, banking and finance. Wura obtained her bachelor's degree in law from the University of Ibadan. Nigeria in 2013 and a master's degree in law from the University of Manitoba in 2017. Wura was called to the Nigerian bar in 2014 and the Saskatchewan bar in 2018. In January 2023, Wura was admitted to the partnership at Miller Thompson. That's a huge feat. Wura is an avid volunteer in a community. She's, a, she's currently a member of the Regina and District Regina and District Chamber of Commerce, where she acts as the vice chair of the board and chairs the governance committee of the board. Wura is a 2023 finalist of the Saskatchewan Silver Spades Young Professional Awards. The award recognizes young professionals in Saskatchewan, ages 35 and under, um, who demonstrate professionalism, including integrity, vision, drive, and perseverance. Please welcome to the podcast episode today, Wura. Da Siva. <laughs> I feel like doing a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Emeka. Thank you. It's such a honor to be here. Yes, it, it's an honor. You know, when I when the, the 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 event we had some time back a few months ago, and uh, you were part of the panel, and you know your delivery and you, the way you 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 spoke and your your insights. You know, I said we have to get you on this podcast, especially. Uh, because uh, you you're an immigrant who moved to Canada and is making huge impact in the community. So I said, you know what, it's going to be a huge honor to have you on the podcast so that you can also inspire people to also believe that there's more, right? So our conversation today, um, it's going to go around the idea of belief, idea of self-belief. So Wura, I want you, I want to jump right into the conversation. Sure. You share your journey of immigrating to Canada. Uh, what inspired it and tell us give us a little bit of background as to who was Wura 15 or 10 years ago okay sure um 15 or 10 years ago so um i'm um 15 years ago i was a teenager um yeah i was in my late teen years 15 years okay. ago okay. um so Wura Wura has always been a very driven person um, Wura has always been the talker in the room. Um, and actually my journey into law it happened that way as well. Um, as a kid, everybody around me said I was eloquent and I, I talked probably a little too much. And you know the way that there people just stereotype you based on certain attributes that you have. And so I guess mine was a positive one, thankfully. Everybody just called me a lawyer or thought I would make a fine lawyer. So mm -hmm. there was no lawyer in the family other than watching TV shows and seeing lawyers. There wasn't really a personal inspiration or a close-up inspiration for that profession. But it was more so just like the comment, the commentary around me, the teachers, the influential people around me, the people of influence, you know, at that stage of my life would have been teachers for the most part, that just said things like that. And, and that kind of spurred me into, yeah, may, maybe who's a lawyer anyway, and what do they do? Hmm. And so um, I got into senior secondary school, senior high school, and it was time to determine whether I wanted to go into the sciences or whether I wanted to go into humanities, which would then set the tone for me to go into law school. And I remember I, I did so well in the junior high that every that the teachers and the school wanted to put me in the science class. And they actually put me in the science class, but on my own, I'm like, no, no way. I'm not doing biology. I do not like blood. I'm not going to be a doctor. <laughs> I want to be a lawyer. So anyway, 
um, 15 years ago, I would have maybe started my journey um, at the University of Ibadan as well, where I studied law. And um, yeah, I'm here now. Your question is two part. So we were 18, 15 years ago or so, and how I got into law school. And then the second part was that about my immigration journey. Mm, yes. Okay, so my immigration journey is also quite fascinating. I, I got into the university uh, again. Um, I'm thankful for the natural qualities I have. I, I think I do have the natural quality of a leader. I do have the natural ability to connect with people and to be able to be a force of influence, a force and a voice, um, if, if, if that makes sense. So um, I got into the university. I ended up being the vice president of the student union. Hmm. The student union had been defunct for 10 years and literally I got shoulder tapped in the entire school by the by the political influencers and they didn't think I could do it. And and I think that's also part of what, you know, we probably will get to that topic later, but just being your authentic self, I am so grateful. And I think that just helps me to shine in my most natural self and in my most authentic self. And so it, it brings out the best in me such that I'm selling myself even when I do not intend to sell myself. So anyway, so university was great and finished finished university in 2013, went to law school in 2014. Um, I started dating my then boyfriend, now husband, and he always wanted to study abroad. He actually started the process in his third year. Um, is the is his dad is a professor, his mom is a doctor, a PhD doctor, so he's in an academic environment and he has always been been very passionate about higher education abroad. Mm -hmm. And so when we started to date, that was a conversation he had with me from the very beginning. I wanted to be a senior advocate in Nigeria and maybe become a minister of justice someday. And even maybe <laughs> You know, so for me, hmm. traveling out was not necessarily a dream or goal. And remember, in in 2014, it wasn't as that wasn't as popular as it has become now. Yeah. Um, so I, I finished university and finished law school, and I was very very blessed to to get into one of the national law firms in Nigeria, Banwani Godalo. That was where I started my career, and hmm. so I was loving it. I mean. My NYSC at Banwani Godalo, I was making a lot of money for, for that age and for, you know, in comparison to other people. It's like, oh, law is good. I, I really like it. And so when, when my boyfriend then, now husband Kay, was like, well, we, we need to talk about this because I'm, I'm, I got admission and I, I've, I've almost told you this is a dream of my mom. I'm not going anywhere. I am here. I love my job and I'm going to enjoy it. And so he started to look into schools for me and actually even applied to Harvard for me. Anyway, that's another story, but he wow. believes so much in me. So he started looking into schools and then would tell me, write a research proposal, write a, a statement of intent, statement of purpose, um, mm -hmm. and your, yeah, your research proposal and all of those, you know, the technical part it would ask me to write. And I would grudgingly write it like, dude, leave me alone. But then it would constantly insist. So anyway, I didn't even know what schools it was applying to, to be honest with you, in Canada. And so one day I woke up to an email, an admission, fully funded scholarship, and I went back to bed. <laughs> And you, you, you saw the same email. I was in Lagos at the time and I was working as well. And he was in Ibada at the time. And he has, he has my push, he has my push notification on his phone as well. So he get he, wow. he gets emails as well. Like he was, he was ready for this me. Is, this, is, ready. this is love, loving to, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, love all the way from Ibada. Wow. So wow. I saw the email. I went mm. to bed. He saw the email and he screamed and then he called me and then, you know, you could tell if a person has read an email. So he saw that I'd read it, like it was opened already, but he was super surprised, very shocked. I hadn't like dropped a message for him. 
I, I probably wasn't excited. Like, so it's like, you've seen it because it's opened anyway. So I'm like, well, I don't even know if I want to go. Okay. I was like, no, this is a big deal. You, you got scholarships and, and you don't have to even worry about paying tuition. And, and this is a good school. So anyway, I could go on about how everything unfolded up until our marriage, our wedding rather, which was also all like divinely orchestrated because again, remember I, I loved my job. I was on the path to um, being senior advocate of Nigeria if possible. And I wanted, I was thinking I would have a PhD by 30, but I was thinking it would just be Unilag. You know, I, I, was, I loved Nigeria and I loved the idea of being there. And, and being a very, very integral part, part of that growth of the country. But let's just say love won. Hmm. Wow. Love always wins, eh? So anyway, always, so, always yeah, we, um, September 4, 2015, we were both on a flight to Winnipeg, Canada, and we landed together for our studies. Wow that is an amazing story the, the kind of the words that jumped out at me when you were talking i want to go back to force and voice you said you were you you you've always known you your force and a voice to be reckoned with and you mentioned being on your authentic self how did you get to realize at that time in retrospect that this is this is something that you you were born with or this is something that you was it born or was it did you have to do something to develop those those um those gifts uh, or talent in you to be able to navigate your way because it's one thing to realize that your force and a voice and it's wanting to be able to use it so would you say that it you just naturally fall into places and opportunities or were there things you had to do to position yourself for those opportunities it's a little bit of both. It's it's innate on one hand, but it's also honed on another hand, like when you hone your skills. So it's also developed on another hand. Um, naturally, I like I'm just like very grateful for the personality that God has given me and how I've been created. And I, I did have very positive influence growing up, particularly my teachers. And that's why I have immense respect for teachers because your teachers teachers speak lives um they speak life into into kids they can speak mm. a lot into kids and so i was very lucky to just have had the best teachers for as as long as i can remember right mm. teachers that just saw that there was something different about me and treated me that way and encouraged me and empowered me um so so that's the back background there and and so there must have been something about my character or my personality and thankfully as well my parents there must have been some kind of way that they raised me that just you know shined through in my day-to-day -day as a kid but i do remember an experience i that that's very very integral to who i have become mm -hmm. i was in i was in ss2 so that's grade 11 here and no actually grade grade 10 i was in ss1 and the the literary and debate club at the uni at the school at, at the high school i wasn't a member but i i was always participating in class so a student whose name is heritage again i cannot forget her was a member of the literary and debate society and she had been there and she just thought I had to be there, but she hadn't said anything yet. But before I got, after I finished my junior secondary exams, there is usually like a window where you start taking some senior classes because you finished those exams early. I went to a military high school. So we, we I think the calendar was a little bit different or the way they did things was a little bit different. For whatever reason, I just, I got obsessed with the dictionary. I got absolutely obsessed with the dictionary. I would read the dictionary. I would pick words that were nasty. And, you know, I'm like, oh, Nick Kumpo, that's kind of <laughs> nice. 
That's bimbo. Oh, bimbo does not like a person that's a like bimbo is a Nigerian name, but it can mean something else as an English word. Mm. So I just was quite fascinated and all of that. But I also picked diction and I also picked transcription. So over time, I got just obsessed with the idea of transcribing my words so I could write a letter phonetically. And so this teacher came into the class and then wrote his wedding date phonetically on the board. And I was the one that read it in a heartbeat, like literally like just read it. Like it was, I was already used to it. That was, that was that experience, you know, whatever led me to be obsessed with the dictionary, whatever led me to just be obsessed with phonetic transcriptions generally and being able to read. And then the teacher told me to write something phonetically on, a, on the board and I could write like a, a whole sentence. I could write like a, an entire passage phonetically. And so he said, you have to be in the literary and debate club. Mm. And that instilled a lot of self-confidence in me because it felt like I was head hunted because before then people had to like audition to join the prestigious literary, literary, literary and debate club. But then I was literally headhunted and Heritage spoke about me in that room and the teacher experienced me in the classroom. So I think there was there's something quite natural about that. Grateful to God, grateful to my parents, grateful to teachers. But just I, as I got older, I realized the aspect of self-development. So I started to read books. I loved books of authors like T.D. Jakes. I loved self-development books. I don't know, I just got, like people would, many of my classmates would read, um, um, would read just like novels and other things, romance novels or criminal crime novels and all of that. I was just like self-help book. How do you how do you get into your signature matters? That was what I was reading in, in secondary school. Mm. I like I can't even remember what the book says now, but there is a book that called that's called something about your signature matters. So those were the kind of books I was reading. How do you get into a room? What are them seven seven habits of a highly effective person. I just enjoyed reading those books. So yeah, there's the natural aspect, um, but there is also the self-development aspect. And I still consider myself an absolute work in progress. Um, mm. I, 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 I do realize there are times that I have not been my, you know, I have my personal standard and I realize that there are times that have been subpar. I am my own biggest critic. Other people tell me to, be not to be hard on myself and to take a chill pill but I am my own biggest critic and I want to be able to tell myself the difficult truth um, before somebody tells me um, as a matter of fact I was having a discussion recently and I said if if somebody needs to tap me on the shoulder to say something that's glaring about a fault or a flaw then I feel like I failed myself if I haven't been able to discover that if I haven't come to that realization on my own. So I do appreciate feedback, obviously, but usually I can anticipate them because I am very aware and I do that self work. So yeah, it's a little bit of both. There's natural, there's the natural aspect for sure, but you're not born with everything. There's always the development aspect as well. Awesome. Okay, so from, your, from what you were saying, um, one of the things that struck me um, and you didn't say this, but I think it's something that I think would have influenced who you are today was the environment you were in, right? Environment in terms of parents, mentors, or people around you. Um, to, to to parents who are in, in this climb, um, who might also be facing that situation of how do, would they be able to create that environment, a culture where their kids can also uh, realize their full potential? Looking back, what would you say, what would be your advice to them in terms of how they can help their kids? Um, because it's obvious that your parents also had an influence in who you are today. So what would you say? Because I think there's something that we need to talk about, especially you know, in Canada, to young parents. What would you say um, in retrospect that your parent did that helped you to, you know, to, to be the person that you are today that parents should also be doing now? Um. My my dad was and still is very inquisitive. So mm -hmm. he he drilled us a lot. He would 
it would um it would ask questions he is a very very intelligent man he would ask questions and engage us engage with us intellectually also just even observing them my dad loved to watch the news. I mean, one Nigerian parent didn't love to watch the news. Nine o'clock NTA every night, seven o'clock BCOS, eight o'clock Galaxy News. You're like seven, eight, nine. Like, can we get a break and watch TV? Can the kids <laughs> actually watch TV? But just like observing them. And I always, mm -hmm. always just saw the way his face, his face always brightened up whenever an intelligent woman was on the screen. Hmm. He, he just had so much respect for like professors, CEOs, like people like um, Okonjo Iwiala. He would just, and then, so that that made me feel like there was something like the world must respect people like this if my father respects them, if my hmm. father is fascinated by them. And I've never told him this, but that that's that I, I just knew that I observed that. Another thing was my dad is very articulate and my dad finished the sentences of people when they were being interviewed. How did he do that? Wow. Like somebody was going was expressing themselves it, like it would it would follow that and it would complete the sentence and the person would say almost exactly the same thing. I mean, just a couple of words, but just the fact that I was doing that. So I think observation is one thing. I, I, kids don't learn based on what we say, they learn based on what we do. Mm -hmm. So I actually do not remember my, my father or my mother sitting me down to teach me things or to tell me these are the ways of life this is you know i i just remember observing a lot in their own interaction and even in how my dad engaged intellectually and i think that's a gift we can give our kids is being the best version of ourselves and letting them see how passionate we are about our work but our, our family is also equally important mm. The world has also changed now where I personally feel that guilt where social media is taken away from our ability to be fully expressive in an intellectually stimulating manner, right? So if you're just on your phone, you're probably just smiling and giggling. So hmm. the, the person on the other side does not even know and they don't have an ability to learn from that, assuming it's something that can be learned. But growing up, we all watched TV, which meant that there was... um you could hear there was feedback right you could hear what was being said on tv you could see your fat i could see my father's feedback and reaction i could learn i could just pick things in there so however we can make sure that we we we, we emulate certain behaviors or behavioral pattern I, I think we just need to know that these kids are watching like we just need to pretend that literally our life and our day-to-day -day, that's projected on a large screen and they're watching that screen mm. so yeah. that that for sure is 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 definitely one thing i would share about the way my parent parented me it wasn't it wasn't say as i do or it wasn't do as i say it was more so like just you know they didn't even have to say it right right influence observation behavioral patterns those were things that jumped out and i think it's very important that as parents to become more intentional about the patterns we create because people oftentimes would not realize that they're trying to fix a problem you know maybe for example the kids but they don't realize that there are patterns that they are, that, are, that, are, that the kids have been watching them do that has not resulted to become a problem. But people want to focus on the problem, not the pattern. So what you said was very important. Let's talk about self-belief. What is, how important is self-belief? Um, you know, especially moving to Canada, you know, in Saskatchewan and doing what you do today, how has self-belief, um, you know, play a key role in what you're doing today? So you're the, I always say this, you're the main cast in your own movie you're the main character you're the you're the most important person in your life hmm. <laughs> hmm. so and it's not selfish it's just actual i wura 
am the most important person in my life, you know? And I'm saying that from a, from a very, very earthly day-to-day -day perspective. Holistically, God is the most important person in my life, right? But being aware of who I am, that is critical. So self-belief, it, it's, it's a journey. It's, it's a journey, it's not a destination, you know, and there are experiences I have day to day that would encourage me, that would sometimes set me back, but I would learn from lessons and I would learn from all of those experiences overall. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, every rejection is a redirection. There is always a way every experience would help you to just become a better version of yourself but being very honest with yourself again being the main cast in your own life in the story of your own life can really just be the determining factor in how you continue to work on yourself and believe in yourself so again i would not say that i i got to a certain point where my confidence just i i would say that it's been a journey um, I remember when I actually started my master's, I dealt with a lot of self-doubt. Um, I dealt with, I struggled with um, my writing style versus my professor's expectation of what my writing style should look like. Academic writing is different, especially mm -hmm. in this part of the world. So I had my personal struggles when I started. Um, um, my my master's program. I had my personal struggles when I when I, I I had my struggles when I started in the workforce as well. Um, I struggled with imposter sy syndrome. I struggled with ability to be heard and understood. Hmm. I struggled with whether or not I was making sense. But one one thing that you cannot you can you can, you can never replace one thing: hard work. You know. Um, the the outlier by, by Malcolm Gladwell, I think it may be the first chapter or the second chapter that talks about um, the, the hours, the work, the time. It talks about different athletes and how many hours they actually put into it to become to become the world, like the world's great, greatest champion when it comes to this sport or this other sport or this activity so if you put in the hours if you actually do your best if you put in the extra time you, you you're not you're not thinking about like oh i'm doing this for my empl employer i'm doing this for myself right because ultimately what the employer gets is the output but that output is based on who i am and what i have Come right on. and yeah. they can't yeah. take that away right so if you switch employers you are you've learned that would be yours completely. So all of the, people talk about working smart. That's a different conversation. Yes, you need to be to work smart. You need to be strategic. You need to form allies. You need to have a sponsor. You need to have a plan for your career. But then working hard, that's still one of the very traditional rules of being successful in life. And, and you cannot take that away or replace that. And I think all of that would just help with that self-belief. All of that would help with that confidence. The confidence I have um, as, a, as an eight-year lawyer is not the same as what I would have, have had as a first-year lawyer. And the confidence I would have as a 15-year lawyer is not what is not going to be the same with what I have now. Also, time is a gift, so we shouldn't beat ourselves up about our beginning. There, you, you, many times kids would crawl before they walk, right? You have the outlier kid that would walk with a little bit of crawling. So time is a gift and giving things time and giving ourselves grace. As much as I am my biggest critic, I also give myself grace. And I understand that things would work out, right? The, the dots will connect in hindsight. I would realize that this delay was necessary for me to learn this thing. Um, often I, I hear people get upset about, you know, being held back in their profession or feeling like there, there's been a delay of some sort. Um, those things happen sometimes maliciously, sometimes for good reasons, no malice intended, but just giving some things time um, without being 
um, without throwing in the towel, right? It, it's a balancing act. Uh, you, you want to be able to accomplish X within a number of months or years, that would, that would at the end of that time period, you would gain more confidence. But you also don't want to be so laid back that you're like, you know what? good will come time would come so it's always creating that it's it's a balance and i'm still working towards that balance you know giving myself grace versus being ambitious am i pushing myself too hard or am i getting relaxed but mm -hmm. yeah it's a combination of different things that help with um with with self-belief and, and confidence great you mentioned hard work i want to take you on that hard work uh because in one part you mentioned hard work requires time but I want to also dig into what exactly would would you describe as the hard work for you, right? Is it giving it time to that particular thing, or are there other components that would would, would be um, infused into hard work for you to be able to be where you are today, to do what you're doing at the capacity at which you're doing it? What would you say are the hard work for you? Because you can say be in a broader sense, but I want us to break down that hard work. What does that mean? Is it is it um, strategic relationship being able to build relationship because relationship is hard work we know that like to be able to sustain uh you know if we walk into people to talk to them it's hard work so what would be your hard work if you want to break it down um it's a it's a it's a lot of different things but if i have to simplify it it would be in in my in my day-to-day -day, in my job my absolute best right I am not sending out an email until I'm confident that I'm proud to put my name behind that email, right? It is mm -hmm. making sure I have considered fully the different perspectives and sometimes calling up a senior lawyer or a colleague to run ideas by them. It, it is it is hard work at that point of just like the quality of your work. And that would also come with the hours and the time that you give to it. Because in, in a profession like mine, and very much like other profession, you become an expert over time, or you do certain things over over and over again. You you learn more and you deep you 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 there's more so a deep dive into that subject matter. And so the hours, the midnight candle period, oversimplifying it, yes. But the midnight candle, um, burning the midnight candle and putting in the hours on the one hand. Mm. On the other hand, it's the strategic relationships. It's it's understand it's the emotional intelligence and working out at that. Mm. It is knowing when to when to keep quiet in a room. It's it's reading the room, reading, reading, reading the the body language and seeing whether you're losing a person, right? And then if you're losing them then maybe you want to pause or maybe you want to say something to bring the attention back. So it's not being casual about everything, but being very intentional. So mm -hmm. there is hard work on that part as well, because you want to make sure that you're able to communicate effectively. You want to make sure that you're able to communicate intelligently. So there is hard work on that part, just the social and emotional intelligence. How do you interact? If we all were working from our basement and 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 no and we don't interact with people, well, yeah, but but if we are going to be interacting with people, if somebody would be <clears throat> reading our emails, we need to know, like sometimes I say this and I don't know if it's good or bad. I say I match people's energy, right? So mm. there are people that when I email them, I'm like, good morning john doe because they've said good morning Wura. there are there are others that just do Wura, comma and go straight to the point i go back to you i say john doe comma <laughs> so but it's in the little mm. things knowing how to interact meaningfully with people that takes hard work that takes being aware so mm. there is hard work on that as well there's hard work in terms of forming relationships and knowing when a relationship is serving you or will serve you or knowing when it stops serving you and that's professionally not so much personally that i'm talking about here knowing who's in the right position to advocate for you behind closed doors and who can be an ally and a sponsor and also there's hard work in terms of self-education reading books reading articles listening to podcasts there is hard work there right because mm. you're not just binge watching a show so all of these come together in when it comes to the self-development of a person so but at the very basic level it is that it takes hours it takes time and it takes effort great I feel like this is a master class let's <laughs> let's talk about relationship beauty I think you know for a lot of immigrants when that's one of the major um, concern 
right? Because you see that people say that they feel isolated um, in their career, in their field. They, they find it hard to be able to see who looks who, who can show them the way, so to speak. They they find it difficult to be able to, you know, see someone who can even speak about them when they're not in the room, sponsors. How have you been able, or what are the strategies you've been able to use to build a relationship? If you're to give that advice to the immigrant, immigrant who, is just, who has been in, you know, in Canada, whatever country they are, what would you say are the tips or strategies to be able to build relationship? Be your authentic self, be very genuine you're likely to connect with a person more meaningfully if you bring your old self into a conversation. If you ask, how are you, and you mean it, right? If we then, if I end up telling you about my weekend or the person ends up telling you about their pet, and then you see them six weeks from now and you actually ask them about the sick pet that they mentioned six weeks ago. You would not always remember the details and that's fine, but if you're present in that conversation, chances are certain things would register, right? So not viewing relationships as transactional. There's the transactional aspect to it, obviously, but just wanting to connect on a very human to human level, you know, I, what, how are you? How was your weekend? And not, not people size people up, and many times they do that wrongly. We all have our unconscious biases as well. Mm. And we all tend to, you know, we look at somebody and we don't think that they're the kind of persons that can offer us something. We need to do some inner working. If you are the best version of yourself, chances are you'll be able to connect more meaningfully with a person because you'll be a, a, a more authentic version of yourself. So in terms of building relationship at work, in terms of building relationship with neighbors, with, with, with co-workers, acquaintances, um, first it's you need to know who you are and you need to be able to connect with yourself so that you can connect better with other people. You also need to be able to sell yourself. You need to understand what value you add, what value you bring. It's it's commonly referred to as an elevator pitch, yeah. although it, that sounds very formal. And I don't know if anybody has actually used that in real life. Um, <laughs> you can, but just it's not just as popular as the concept itself. You know, chances are I'll, I'll, I'll meet you and say, hi, MK, it's so nice to meet you. All right, it's very nice to see you. I've, I've seen you online and all of that. So what do you do, Wura? I probably wouldn't go straight into my 30 second condensed, you know, it's going to be more conversational. Um, but being able to actually have an elevator pitch, assuming you were to need it, who are you? What do you represent? What value do you bring? But then you need to be adaptable. My, I feel like some sometimes we hold well, we hold ourselves back or we struggle because we're not adaptable. So if you meet this person, you introduce yourself the same way as if you meet this other person, right? So if I were to meet an Indian and I want to connect with them and have a conversation with them, I likely would talk about my Indian colleague who's my work buddy. Or I likely would talk about something else that's connected. Or if I wanted to, if I'm meeting with somebody who's from who's traveled to certain places, then I probably would talk about my travel as well. You know, and that all still stems from authenticity. Now, when you build meaningful relationships or when you engage with people, you can also see and determine the energy they give back to you. But don't write them off so quickly because people have their days, right? You can meet with me in the store today and maybe I have a sick child and I'm there to grab um, medication and I'm, I'm, I'm on my way out. And then you're like, oh, she's snobbish or she's not warm. And then you've, you've written off that relationship or that person based on one interaction. You should have minimum of three interactions with a person before you make that assessment as to whether you want to continue to develop that relationship and whether there is value in it, right? Mm -hmm. And in the workplace, there is always also just understanding the culture of the workplace. How do things happen here politically? 
being aware of the political climate of your workplace, being aware of how decisions are made. And it doesn't mean you're sucking up to the person who makes the decision. It just means that you're being strategic in terms of how you communicate your accomplishment right because you also have to sell yourself you have to sell celebrate yourself you have to let people know what you're doing if you're writing a lot of articles if you're doing a lot of things and the people that need to know that you're a thought leader don't know then there is a disconnect there so understanding the political climate is knowing how decisions are made asking questions genuinely and and curiously um so yeah it, it's always a it's always different strategies depending on where you work if you're with the within the government um the, you're going to in, interact differently than if you're in private practice or you work with a with an owner with a ceo who owns the with an owner who manages their company an owner managed business the interaction you would have would be different and in terms of growth your growth the moment you've been at a place for a while you should start asking the question but you should be asking from a perspective of I care about this place as much as I care about myself. So if I'm better for myself, I'm better for this place. How, what kind of development do I need to be to better serve this organization? If we also approach things from that perspective of not just about me, not just about my money, not just about a promotion, but how can I genuinely contribute to the success of this place? People would see that, right? the people that need to know would would notice but don't forget to talk about it as well but then so it, it's a lot of different things and i don't know if i've been able to properly yes with them but yes yeah. you have yeah. you have and I, it, it brings me to one um there's a there's a framework that you know i can't remember who was the author of this framework but it's something that i've heard um, i remember one of the a director was telling me some time ago and i've always worked with this uh it's around the pie formula where p is performance i image e exposure um if if we use that framework now to 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 apply to to your journey, how would you say that these three things have been able to position you for um, for opportunities? The P being the performance, I being image, E being exposure. Because I think it's very vital if we're looking at uh, especially immigrants um, or you know professionals in general to position themselves. How would you say you've been able to use these three? Uh, um, um, framework to be able to position yourself for opportunities performance it's quality of work it's hard work it's asking the right questions it's engaging intellectually um and i and i i try my best at that you know i i, I do my work with so much pride and i put in a lot of thoughts into it um there is no perfect work so mm. i strive to be better as well so on the performance side it is seeking feedback and and working on it. And sometimes the feedback is from clients, right? Understanding our clients would like you to work with them. There are clients that don't want emails after five o'clock, but there are clients that would absolutely be thrilled to hear from you at 1 a.m. Being emotionally intelligent to understand the needs of different clients rather than using a one, a one hat fits all approach. So performance is very nuanced in that regard, you know, just understanding the delivery of your work product and who's receiving it and the hours and the quality, you know, so the quantity, the time and the quality um, of, of the work. Image, you you need to, I, I personally believe that I, I am a brand on my own. And so, whenever i'm meeting with someone even now when i'm when i'm going to the store i am mindful of how i am dressed as as vain as that sounds it is true right because you never know when you when you when you would have an opportunity to connect with someone and you never mm -hmm. know what impression you would be creating um in the workplace i am very mindful of my image both outward looking how I look, but how I also come across. Um, there is a woman who's a coach when it comes to like feminism and feminine energy. And I didn't even know there was something like that, but she talks with so much grace and class. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> I should probably take this woman's class um, or this woman's master class or something. But, you know, and it's, it's not, it's not, you know, confidence, but making sure that you understand 
the point where maybe your confidence may rub off the wrong way as arrogance, but not being shy about being confident and 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 presenting yourself confidently. So image image also actually ties to what you have, what your your ability to intellectually engage with with someone. Image also trends because attraction is not physical anymore. Attraction is not how you look, right? Attraction is more so how you can connect. Attraction is more so. I enjoyed talking to Wura or I enjoyed talking to Emeka. It would be nice to see him again. Or the next time I see him, I can't wait to pick it up, pick it up from where we stopped. So making sure that you are ready to engage in a very meaningful way. Being aware of what's going on in the environment, right? Um, if if there is if there is something in the headlines, even if it's five minutes that it takes you to get to bring yourself up to speed when it comes to what's 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 going on. You don't know what conversation would happen that would help you shine through because mm -hmm. you come across as being aware. So that all plays into image. There's the physical part of how you present yourself, how you look. But there's also the part of how you express yourself. And then exposure. I believe strongly that that framework completely interconnected. Exposure is, you know, the, the fact that we're Nigerians and we're here, we have a different level of exposure right and i'm grateful for that because i feel like like my my history my background is very very um it's such an integral part of who i have become the hustle culture in nigeria trying to get the boss and i don't know if you were ever in any of those high schools where you had to like you had to you had to be smart because you had to like find your way into like to be able to i was very i was tiny so i was cute so if the people were struggling for to, i would just like find a way to crawl there's always space between legs. Mm -hmm. I don't know, if you know that. So just like sneak, sneak, sneak into the bus. <laughs> but um, exposure, no experience is a waste. No knowledge is a waste. What do you take in, right? Because what you take in would reflect in what you give out, right? So um, exposure is a combination of everything. But exposure is also very, very tied to interaction. Mm. And that's why people that are introverts would need to work harder when it comes to exposure because they need to find the exposure from other sources like literature, like, you know, because exposure, like my conversation with you, I am taking something away from this, which is mm. PIE, P -I -E, performance, image and exposure. Right mm. now, I'm exposed to that terminology that I otherwise wouldn't have known or I, I may have had to like going like i probably would have stumbled on it in a book but maybe mm. it wouldn't have struck with me the same way it struck in five minutes in in having this conversation with you so yeah i i do i i do put myself out there as well and and I this can, i can see that you don't need to tell me <laughs> I, and this, yeah, I saw that I event recently in saskatchewan uh, was it um it was organized by is it viterra or so it's, yeah and i saw yeah. the platform was like oh my goodness what are you doing on the stage <laughs> I yeah, like, I, I, I put it. myself out there, and and mm. I I only post half of my events actually on on social media on on mm. LinkedIn. Like mm. I don't even post everything because I mean life and work and everything. And you also right, want to be right. able to use the space in a way that you yeah like personally I don't want to become a noisemaker. <laughs> Right, right as a platform but um but exposure i had to make an intentional effort this year in particular to speak more about the rooms i'm in right mm -hmm. and part of that exposure is yeah i'm attending events um and you know people so so the the founders of cob smes coalition of black and small and medium businesses enterprises i want to give them a shout out i see them in rooms and it fills my heart with so much joy to see other pe black people in such rooms. For example, the event you're, you're talking about, that was on Tuesday. The premier was actually there. It was attended by very influential political and business leaders in the community and across the country. And, and it's, a, it's a show, it's an ag show, agriculture, it's a farm show. So they were actually like um, representatives of businesses from outside the country as well. So very diverse and rich audience if if i might add that and just being in that room and i was mc i, I was i was the mc um um at that event and i saw yinka and lola and i was so happy because i just felt like yes my people are in the room 
you know, we, we don't know how we empower one another, even silently. You know, it's like there's a thumbs up there, just seeing somebody. And I've heard it. I've heard people say to me as well. And I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity to be to be to to be a light in some fashion, to be to shine, to hold the touch, to be a touch bearer in some fashion. But exposure is is the, is is part of that. I mean, people think that there may not be value to attending some of these events, but we need to get out of our own circle and be out there connecting with different other communities. And sometimes before I go to an event like that one on Tuesday, I had to leave the house at six thirty. That was not convenient. It meant I had to wake up earlier. It meant I had to get dressed earlier. You know, and it was it was a cold and windy mo- morning. But I got there and I was so happy. I was so grateful for the opportunity. I saw Yinka and Lola. There was just that, you know, camaraderie of like seeing other people that you can associate with. Um, so yeah, exposure is very critical. And I think we need to do a better job, regardless of whatever, if you are a small business owner, even if you're your target market is um is um even if your target audience or market is the ethnic people you sell ethnic food you can still interact with with other communities because there's there's shared knowledge that can happen there you can be part of a local organization of like food vendors because there's learning that can happen there and and that's how we spread our wings and that's how we thrive and that's how we succeed so yeah the pie rule, whoever made it up, is a genius. <laughs> and I agree that those principles have worked for me. For you. Yeah. And when you mentioned, uh, talking about, you dwell on the image part, and you mentioned something around v- visual image. Uh, but also part, I also think that has worked for you from my observation, and I, what I've seen for most people is the vocal image. Because sometimes, before we even open up, before we... Before we enter a room, people can tell when we open our mouths. And before we even say the way we, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we speak actually increases either our perception or reduces our perception. So I think that part of vocal image, being able to command the room with your words, the way you speak and carry yourself also plays a very cure. So thank you for sharing that so beautifully. Uh, I'm gonna go to this question. I think it's something around, uh, something that for, for the new migrants, people who are, and in Canada, because we have a lot of immigrants who listen to this podcast, what would you what would you say? What advice would you give to those who are struggling to get their foot, you know, in the door um, to you know realize their potential, especially in the legal practice? Because I've seen a lot of people, you know, who have find it difficult to break in into legal practice in Canada, um, but other professionals as well. What would you what would be your advice for those who are struggling to get in? Um, you're not alone. That, that's what I'm going to start with. You're not alone at all. Um, so, so find the right community of support when it comes to new immigrants in certain professions. I know that medical doctors, they have like an association and so they, they probably offer some kind of mentorship. I know that for lawyers, um, there is Niger lawyers, Niger lawyers in Canada, and there are other platforms as well, foreign trained lawyers, NCA, um, NCA is the Committee on Accreditation for Lawyers. So the accrediting body, there, there are organizations and supporting, bod- um, supporting bodies as well that, that can provide support, ask questions, and, and you're not alone. And also, if I have any, 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 any words to encourage anybody, it's that um, d- don't be shy. And I find this a little bit with people that move here if when they're a little bit older, you know, when they've, when they're coming in at a certain level, they're already at a certain level in their career. And there is that overwhelming feeling of starting afresh. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to feel that because I was out of school. I had worked for one year, a little bit less than one year. I, I moved here from school. So I didn't feel like I was leaving a whole career behind. I didn't feel like I was starting afresh. Um, I was starting afresh, but not fresh, fresh, not mm. somebody who's living a 15 year career or a 10 year career or a five year career. Um, and I, my interaction with a few of those people is that they, 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 they hold back because they have this feeling of, you know, uh, permit this expression for non-Nigerians, but it's called 
it's that na condition make crayfish bend. Mm. You know, it's like if I were in Nigeria, I would be your boss. So mm. I, if I were in Nigeria, if not because we all moved here and this place is a leveler, um, I feel like that mindset can hinder progress. That mindset can hinder growth because there's nobody that can, there's no, but there's, you can write off a person that can potentially be of help, that can mention your name in the room or that can pass along the right opportunity. So yeah, it can be overwhelming to have to interact with somebody who's younger and who looks like their director in their workplace or their already manager and you feel like you're starting all over again. But give it time, time is a gift. Um, and, and it works out, it works out ultimately, but it's about asking the right questions. I also find that the circle of people that you interact with when you get into the country can play such a significant role and influence so much the exposure and the drive that you have. And sometimes remember that coming here is already like so overwhelming that if you then get into the circle that tends to tell you that, oh, this is what we all do. We all have to do X and Y. Or oh, you would never get to this position. Or oh, it's very difficult. Or oh, racism is a thing. Yeah, there may be some truth in some of those expressions, but if that's what you surround yourself with, or if that's what you tend to hear most of, it, it has a way of just speaking to your soul in a way that you may not be able to control and it can inhibit the growth that you can see or where you can see yourself. But if you can interact, if you can broaden the, the scope of people that you interact with, and, and here, it's okay to reach out to people on LinkedIn and ask them for a coffee chat. It's okay to send a cold email. The worst thing that would happen is that they would not respond. That's and right, that could right. just be because they're busy. It's not because they're bad people. You can email a director, any government director, you'll find their information online if you if you know their name. Any, you know, anybody that works with a with us with, with a government authority or private practice or owns a business, there's always some kind of contact, you know. But then when you reach out, how do you reach out? Right? Because that's also the challenge I face sometimes is somebody reaches out to me on on LinkedIn and says, Hi, how was your day? Period. And then five days after. Hello, how are you doing today? You know, it's like, yeah, it's nice. Thank you for checking in on me. But I know that, like, just can you cut to the chase, please? You know, so have a way that you present yourself and be be willing to interact with people because there's something that you would learn or there's something that can open up an opportunity and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I've said a lot there. You I'll let you lot. ask a follow-up question because I also feel like I haven't said it all. <laughs> but no, I'm also you, you, you said there may yeah. be more that you may have to ask. Yeah, you, you said a lot. And I think that the part where you mentioned that people should be willing to come out of their comfort zone and reach out is very crucial because I've seen people, you know, my work who were afraid to even reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, for example, to say, hey, can you, the worst that can happen is they say no, right? And how do you reach out, right? Like, you you don't know someone before and the first thing you're saying is, hi, how have you been? Or like. There's no connection to how have you been? Why you send that as a first message, right? So yeah. how do you send a message that is called come across as professional, but still got part of the chase, right? Like, and it, yeah, sometimes you have to read the room to know what the person and what they do and all of that to know is this person going to respond to me early or, or quickly or what what kind of what kind of person is 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 this person in terms of the profile and know how do you reach out to that person so thank you for mentioning that as well we're going to go to final question here around what are the lessons you have learned so if you're going to sum up your journey in the last uh you came in 2014 right so that's like 10 years. nine oh nine okay we came the same time okay 2015 okay cool <laughs> if you have to sum up your lessons in eight uh for the last eight years what would you say are the five important lessons that you have learned about you know resilience or power believing in yourself that you want to share with those who are going to be listening oh right wow that's a that's a, a tough question um but yeah i will try my best to itemize the five lessons i have learned yeah <laughs> I have my pen and a notepad here um so um the the first thing i would say is um believe in yourself and believe in in god or whatever else helps you to wake up each morning and feel like yeah i'm grateful that i'm alive 
for me, that would be God. That would be Jesus. Um, believe in God and believe that you're not here by accident and do whatever it takes to work on your mind and your mental health and fill your head and your mind with the right things, the right materials, the right information, the right people and connection. Mm. Please put the work in yourself. Um, that is, you know, that is one lesson or one thing that I just feel like I know, I know that I'm I'm a girl helped by God. I know deeply. I know so much. I I live, I, I have so much confidence in in just who's I get back in. Preach hey, it. <laughs> you, you, you I was gonna say that. <laughs> I get back in and mm. and it's not arrogance. I just know so much that I have a God who loves me. Mm. And believe so much in in whatever it is i, I hope it's it's god it, but believe believe that you have what it takes um and help yourself prep yourself be your own biggest cheerleader journal if you have to write it out say it in front of the mirror if you have to do mm -hmm. the inner working that's number one number two there are good people out there oh i can't yeah. say that enough there are good people out there and mm. do not let any experience or do not let what people have said impact your ability to connect or to see the good in people so one lesson i've learned is there are good people out there and i'm on a mission to be one of them and i'm on a mission to find more good people um mm. number three i would say um number three spread your wings spread your wings um don't be don't be shy don't be shy, spread your wings completely, connect with people, be yourself, go out there, be audacious, um, dare yourself to do something you you would um you would otherwise not do, you know. For me, that is approaching the conversation about becoming a partner in my workplace. You know, I self-doubt with imposter syndrome and self-doubt would say, no, who do you think you are? But just spreading my wings. And again, to your point, what's the worst you can hear? It's a no. But then even when you hear a no, it's an opportunity to go back to the drawing board and, and re-strategize and re-strategize. Number four, um, educate yourself, you know, and I feel like it ties back to that number one of just, but number one is more so knowing who you are. Number, number four is educating yourself. Um, I, I find that, and educating yourself is also like how you present, how you come across. I really like that you talked about the vocal presence. Um, it's it's totally fine. Not everybody would have the ability to necessarily command the room vocally, but working on yourself such that if you're a person of few words, you actually, your few words count, count. right? Yeah. Um, and working in, on yourself such that you take feedback, you like, I still take feedback on like, okay, I probably need to speak a little slower. I probably, you know, so working on yourself and educating yourself, pick up a book off the shelf, watch a show that can help you understand the history of Canada. You know, sometimes it's kind of heartbreaking to see that people have been here 15 years, they've moved into this country um, and they now call this place home, but still can recite the national, the, the anthem. Right. It's like, are you, are you, have you truly immersed yourself into the culture? Do you, do you know the history of where you call home? What culture, what values are you passing on to your kids? Um, and I don't know, what would be the five, what would be the fifth thing? Listen to this podcast and listen to other podcasts and pick the lessons from those podcasts. That would be number five, but that'll probably give you a million other lessons. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. This is, this is a uh, very, very impactful. And I think the fourth one, the third and the fourth one, all are all very important, but the third and the fourth one, I think is something that you, that is very vital where you spread your wings. And for me, spread your wings cut across even to the point where you're able to explore other areas that you know that are of interest to you or you're passionate about. Because oftentimes we get, you know, we can be so, caught up with, especially for those who are yet to find a job, I said to them, so you might have other interests, find a way to express that such that you are out there doing something that might not necessarily be connected to your job, but it's something you're interested in about, but it helps you to connect to people, build relationship. And then in those conversations, people will ask you, what do you do? And then you yes. say, hey, this is what I do. Yes. And you never can tell what doors can open. So spread your wings. And number four is self-education. 
that was so powerful because we can get so busy working and little time growing. I see people, I say, you can be 10 years, 10 years experience, and you still have no breath to your experience. Yes, it's possible. It's possible. And that's why you see people when they get laid off or they get, you know, and yeah, retire, they're looking at what else to do. But if you uh, immerse yourself in self-education, understanding other areas of your life, there's so much more that you would do. Ura, I don't want to take so much of a time. Our guests, we ask them the final three questions. I don't give those questions in advance. I tell them here, you're going to answer the question in one word, or you can especially on the word. Number one, was there any, if any, was there ever a moment where you seriously considered giving up and what ultimately kept you going? Yes. Uh, there be a moment. Yes. What keeps me going? Girl, you got to keep doing this. What option do you have? And, and honestly, that's it. What a, like giving up is not an option. It's not. What does that mean? Hmm. Hmm. What does that mean? It's not an option. So do the self work, do whatever needs to be done. Take a break if you have to. Maybe drive to Moose or go to Saskatoon, a staycation, do whatever you need to do, but get your act together. Don't, don't wallow in self pity. Hmm. What's your next move? What's your strategy? And journal, write, write it out. What's troubling me? And how did I get to this point? And what can I control? And what's out of my control? Come on. Wow, that's powerful. Second question. What's the most unconventional piece of advice you've received that turned out to be incredible value, incredibly valuable? Unconventional piece of advice. Ha! Huh? Your blackness is a gift. Hmm. There's something there's something about like in this in this present age and time, your blackness is a gift. Your the fact that you're, immig you're an immigrant is a gift. Use that wisely. Um, some people call it, what do they call it again? Diversity higher. Well, as long as I got my foot in the door, I'm going to prove to you that whatever the reason was for hiring me, that's just your reason. I deserve a place here and I am going to earn my spot here. So mm. your blackness is a gift. I'm, I'm proud to be a woman. I'm proud to be a black woman. I'm proud to be an immigrant. I feel like those all those are things that embody who I am. And those actually give me certain unique opportunities. As, as much as there are certain disadvantages that we all know and we can talk about, those are actually some of the reasons certain doors have been opened. And that's very unconventional um, acknowledgement that your blackness can be a gift or the fact that you're an immigrant or a minority person, a visible minority person can be a gift. But yeah, I have been told that, where are you are hot cake. People like you are in demand. And when I say people like you, it's like the fact that you're an immigrant, the fact that you're a woman, the fact that you're intelligent and you can still function at the same level as the mainstream population or even at a higher level so mm. not just do you get an opportunity to you know compete globally with the mainstream population but you also then have other things that create the uniqueness that you bring to the table wow wow we should i i have to go back and listen to this episode the last thing <laughs> the the last question if you could go back in time and give your younger immigrant self one piece of advice, what would it be? I often get that pause in that question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be all right. I think that's maybe the advice I would give because now it's all right. There was a lot of anxiety um, as a mm. new there was a lot of anxiety, sleepless nights, the tears, the fear, the feeling of rejection and dejection, um, the feeling of maybe I'm not accepted and maybe I'm not wanted. Hmm. And if, if there's anything I would say to my younger self or my newer version, my, the newer immigrant that I would have been at the time, it, it is that keep going, girl. It's going to be all right. And keep going, guys. It's gonna be all right. <laughs> I feel like I'm very. I like. I like. I'm very women centric. Women. Course, so and, you can, people can switch out the necessary part, but I think it would apply as well. The advice would. Oh yes, I mean, when I look at the, the stats, women are the most. Uh, they're the most listeners, so I am not surprised. Um, of, great. Of, yeah, I mean, and, and it tends to be that it, when when I look at my guest, 
the highest guest in terms of you know male or female is is the female so yes women women are powerful women do great things and i think we can take lessons from all that you shared Bura. i'm so grateful for your time here on the podcast today um so one last word if you're to give a last word what would that be to those listening and watching today um you're amazing and you have you have your uniqueness and do us do a deep dive and and come to love yourself for who you are while not being complacent so that you can develop into a better version of yourself you, you are unique there is not a replacement for you in the workplace people say that but just for who you are like there is just one mak there's just one Bora. so in the in the home for example there isn't a replacement for me in my life there isn't a replacement for me i mean i'm the main cast of my life so um yeah you you are unique you're amazing put in the work to be a, a version of yourself that you would continue to love and, and that's in all aspects that's in fitness and physical appearance that's in what we eat that's in what we do that's in like it's it's everything um yeah love yourself put in the work to love yourself there you have it folks this has been an enriching enriching conversation i think it's 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 a whole holistic conversation we went to family we went to now we talked about food yeah <laughs> i know right it's been a, a rich conversation. Thank you so much, Wura, for being on the show today. For those who are going to be watching on Facebook, uh, on YouTube, please make sure that you leave a comment about today's episode uh, and like and share. And if you're also listening on Spotify or Apple, make sure that you also follow this podcast, rate the podcast as well. It will help us get that visibility to those who don't know about this podcast. And to come here next, you'll win next time. Remember, your growth is personal. No one is responsible for your personal growth, but you. Stay blessed and bye for now. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you love this episode, share it with your friends on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. If you haven't already done so, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our episodes. And give us a rating. This will help our podcast get more visibility to those who don't know about this podcast. Remember, your growth is personal. No one is responsible for your personal growth but you. Stay blessed.